anything for the moment, or would you like to delay it? Okay, we'll wait for the panel. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce Bill Rand Bill, you at the back there. Bill Randolph is the Associate Dean Research and, uh, for Built Environment at the University of New South Wales, and he's also Director of um, City Futures, um, which is by far the largest urban research centre in Australia. Um, so Bill, Bill will uh, introduce the panel, who will come to the stage at this point. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Alan, for that, uh, that introduction. Um, while uh, while the, uh, the panel are assembling themselves and also uh, assembling their, uh, their microphones, um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, drone on for a little bit. Um, I'd like to thank John for that very, very stimulating and very factful uh, presentation. I think we all saw so many similarities with what uh, is going, has gone on in the UK and the similar things that are going on here in, in our own city and also cities elsewhere in Australia. Uh, and that suggests some communality of, of issues which should come out of uh, John's talk. I hope the panel would pick up on. Um, we do have uh, an august panel of urban luminaries to end this week of luminosity. So uh, if I can, I'm not sure if they're in the right order on the stage, but it doesn't matter anyway. Um, you will know these people because they're extremely uh, well known in, in, in Sydney and beyond, of course. Uh, I'll quickly introduce them by name. Then I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves a little bit just to say, what, what, uh, what their particular area of expertise in relation to this uh, issue around urban design and, uh, and how it relates to urban planning. Uh, and to ask them to uh, just say one thing that they think uh, is going to be a critical issue about how we uh, improve urban design and integrate it with urban planning. And I think one of the points that I'd like to bring out this evening, we uh, have, have titled uh, the, the, the event a little bit provocatively, we hope, um, is urban design enough? Uh, how do we retool our, our, the Australian cities? Uh, is to say, look, you know, urban design does one thing, but urban planning does, other, uh, does another thing, and yet, we have, we have a system, we have a planning system which urban design has become increasingly an important, quite rightly, an important factor. Uh, can the two things uh, work in, in practice together? John's talk showed us how important it seemed to be, in the British case, to have strong government support, to have things working together, to have politics working together, to have the to have the market working with the urban design outcomes that were, 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 were desired. And where that started to fall down was where those things just weren't there. Politics were, were, were antagonistic. The market couldn't deliver the, the outcomes because it was too expensive or whatever. So can we get good urban design outcomes within a, a strategic planning system in the context of our current cities? Well, look, I'll quickly go through uh, who we've got um, on the panel, uh, we've got, well, starting from, that's left, I think, left, uh, left to right, we've got uh, Peter John Cantrell from Zan's uh, Associates, uh, and Alec is here tonight, so he's keeping an eye on you, I suppose. Um, we've got Graham Yarn from uh, City of Sydney. Uh, we've got um, Peter Thallis from uh, Hill Thallis uh, uh, Architects and Urban, Des Urban Planning. Uh, we've got Emeritus John uh, Lang from our own built environment uh, faculty. We've got Lucy Turnbull, who uh, is known to you all for all sorts of things, but she was, is an ex-mayor of, of the city of Sydney. And finally, John sitting at the end. So if you start from left to right very quickly, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what brings you here, apart from the fact that you were asked to be here, and the one key thing you got out of John's, uh, John's, John's presentation. So, um my name is Peter John Cantrell, and with my colleague Philip Thallis, who's also on the panel, we've just completed a book called Public Sydney, Drawing the City. And that book indicates a key concern we have in the city, which is the creation and maintenance 
of a rich, vibrant, supportive, equitable, extensive, unambiguous uh, public part of the city, which will generate value for private development and for an enjoyable life in the city. And what I'm interested in is through comparative analysis, I think it's clear that Sydney needs to have the following, and it needs it rapidly and um, emphatically. Increase public transport, increase citywide density, accompanied by stopping the development of productive rural lands and the wilderness, and increased amenity in both our public and private spaces. Thank you. Graham. Okay, um, Graham Young, so I'm the Director of City Planning, Development and Transport at the City. That's about 275 people. And uh, I guess my brief is the strategic planning framework for the city, individual planning proposals to redevelop sites, the major urban renewal areas in the southern part of the city, which is often projects, I think, for the university, and um, how the assessment process applies a number of the things that were discussed uh, to tonight. And I guess the one thing that, uh, if you put it that way, I got out of your presentation is just how similar the tensions are between the issues uh, in the UK and in Australia and that um, the issue of confusion and clarity and leadership helps to break through ownership and involvement on certain directions. And so I'd like to come back to that question. Okay, thanks. Peter. <coughs> um, it's going to be very hard for John to say anything new by the end of this, but um, uh, central, I think, to thinking about the city is the public interest, and particularly how the public space is made in the broadest public interest in the most inclusive way. And I think that that leads one to reflect on the topic and the schism in planning where the planning system in New South Wales actually doesn't recognise the public domain as a thing at all the streets, the public domain, simply are absent. There isn't a great city in history and there isn't a great city to today that isn't founded on its great streets, its great public places and the like. It, that is absent from our planning because our planning is basically de development enablement or development suppression. And so it's completely uh, left out the thing which is most important, the thing most important to us, the thing that is actually the representation of democratic society itself the physical re representation, which is the public space. There are obviously a number of exemplars, and Alec did uh, implore us to be um, controversial here, so I will mention the B word, which is around the corner, Barangaroo, as in a sense a paradigm of all that is bad. And there are lots of English examples as well. And there's actually a very good book on uh, English contemporary planning uh, called Ground Control by Anne Minton, which talks about this mm -hmm. surreptitious privatisation of pseudo-public domains. And I think we're in the middle of that, if you look at uh, the old Carbon United Brewery site, and particularly Barangaroo, but in fact all up and down the harbour, you see pernicious examples of these sorts of tendencies. And of course in England, they're led by Australian companies. So plenty to talk about. John. My concern has always been with urban design per se, but it's been biased by the work that I did with the Environmental Research Group in Philadelphia for 20 years. The focus of the work was on developing design briefs for buildings varying from um, orchestra halls to psychiatric facilities to the rejuvenation of public housing. And uh, much of the urban design work was, working, was with community groups ranging from the wealthiest neighborhood in Philadelphia to um, very poor neighborhoods. And we had to deal with the differences in taste cultures so that in working in some areas, there'd be um, problems that I saw which the local community regarded as a solution. Okay. In doing this work, I became very concerned with the nature of theory and the nature of what works and what does not work. And in a, in a fairly abstract way, both in terms of process but also in terms of product. The problem with uh, my work, which has been criticized by people that I do respect, including one international figure who regards it as cute, um, is that it's not the way that architects work. Architects work from generics, generic ideas. And so my question or thought in terms of John's presentation was, was how do you turn policies into generic ideas which are multi-dimensional? We have lots of single um, 
variable um, generic ideas, but how do you turn them into um, generic models that are applicable across the board? Thanks, John. No, Lucy, just okay. a little bit about who you are. Okay. My name is Lucy Turnbull. I, quite a long time ago now, I was the Lord Mayor of Sydney. I've been out of city politics since 2004. Since that time, I've maintained a high level of interest in cities and urbanism in general in various roles. I'm very involved with the Committee for Sydney. I have served for the last couple of years on a COAG Reform Council advisory panel on, on cities and their metropolitan planning. I think my particular area of interest is um, the interplay between placemaking and urban design on the one hand and the city as a system on the other. And I'm very concerned that placemaking and urbanism has a strong connectedness and interplay to support and, and manage a lot of changes that are going on in our society, like technological change, of course, and innovation, to promote innovation and to make our cities a, a crucible for innovation. But also, on the other hand, to manage great challenges, like you know, which we have been managing, I would say, not terribly well over the last decade or so, population growth. But I think the big sleeper is, and this is where urbanism and placemaking can play a very big role in managing the challenges of demographic change in an ageing community. So, although there are lots of similarities with the UK, my understanding is that the UK is not struggling to the extent that Australia is with population growth, especially in our larger cities. And I'm particularly interested in how those sort of systems interplay and macro forces interplay with transportation planning and economic planning as well. Okay, well thanks. There's a, there's a lineup of, uh, of, of, of issues and questions which I hope you can get your teeth into as we go through the, uh, the next uh, Q&A session. Look, I'll, I'll kick off, if that's all right, uh, with, a, with a question I'd like to throw into the pot. And, um, it comes from, uh, it stems from a reading of John's uh, paper, which, uh, Alan, it's called uh, Urban Design in Central Sydney, 1945 to 2002, in progress in planning. I do recommend it. It's an extremely good paper uh, that John wrote after spending some time at UNSW in the early uh, noughties, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and you pick up a quote uh, from Long, uh, 1998 quote, where critique of the Melbourne Docklands, basically. Um, and what was going on at that time uh, uh, in, in the Melbourne Doctors, which we've seen similar similarities with other cities in Australia. And he talks about um, the city of urban design and planning in Docklands creating the city of spectacle, footloose global capital, waterfront showpieces inhabited by post-industrial bourgeoisie. Planning becomes facilitating development with a bit of urban design thrown in to keep things nice. Ethics sacrificed to aesthetics in the global competition between cities. Now, that's a, quite a, a damning d indictment of what urban design is and how, how planning has been turned into essentially a facilitation for development. So I suppose the question uh, I've got to ask the, ask the panel to get off, is, is urban design ever going to achieve anything other than just the delivery of the city of spectacle? And what role can we, 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 we see of, 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 of urban design in actually attempting or actually driving real change uh, in a planning process which is compromised essentially by the market? And I think that came out of John's, uh, John's uh, presentation. So, urban design, what's, yeah. you, what's its use? Well, um, the assumption is that these developments of the city of spectacle are what makes the city. But in fact, when you look at the city as a whole, they occupy very little space. They accommodate very little numbers of people. They do occupy a lot of media, and they probably occupy a lot of people's, some people's, prominent pastimes. So my first thought is that, in fact, it's a kind of distraction, this argument. And my second thought is that urban design, where it's valuable, is for the whole of the city, not for the, just these are small areas of speculation. And when you look at the whole of the city, there's a lot to do. There's um, how to improve people's daily lives by making the quality of their housing better, as good as possible, which we saw some examples here, and which we are seeing successfully in Sydney in comparison to Melbourne through the residential flat building design code. It's undoubted that housing quality has improved in Sydney in the last decade where it has gone backwards in Melbourne, for example. 
The second thing, of course, is that the quality of our public spaces, particularly our streets and also parks, places where you spend your time, have been declining. They've been declining most notably since the state government abolished the Width of Streets Act, which allowed people to make streets narrower, with less trees, with less frontage and so forth. So um, the second area of attention, I think, is throughout the city in improving the quality of our public spaces. And of course, improving the quality of the public spaces increases the value of what fronts onto them. And that is, of course, the private development that drives the uh, sort of medium part of our economy. And so I think that's quite important. So I kind of don't really interact with your speculation in a way. Okay. But, but you, you raised the issue that, um, that I think uh, Lucy and Graham can comment on because they're involved in or have been involved mm. in the local politics and the local uh, governance of, of our cities very much so. That well, how much of all this really stems from government action up front, public intervention, public intervention in, in creating public spaces, in creating value, which then the market uses to drive the changes that we all are looking for. So, I guess at this point, I would try and make, I don't know if you can hear me, the distinction between, in a way, the product design question of urban design, the relationship between elements, and actually working out what the elements are. And, and the work that's been going on, I guess, over the last four or five years is trying to understand what is the economic underpinning of Sydney, for example, this city, um, over the next 20 to 50 years. We, we know it was wheat and it was sheep, and this building is a remnant of an economic underpinning which has now left this city, and in fact left it um, as a remnant that we can use for these talks. But that was a very powerful flow of, of finance and capital into the city and export. And we're in a totally different place. We've got, a, um, we've got to understand exactly what the competitiveness of the city is. We have to have a common ownership and understanding broadly by the community at different, in different levels about what that is and then apply that vision to the way we need to arrange the development of the city to deliver our ability to continue to prosper in that way as a city. And part of that is understanding exactly how every element of the workforce, including those who are not able to work, fit into that model. And I guess that's where the public transport question comes in because that's the future investment of that rapid public transport totally changes the affordable housing issue. Yeah. If you can access vast tracts of land out from the city centre quickly, it's that 30 to 45 minute travel thing. Yeah. At the moment, the inner city is very well serviced by bus and rail. So there's an intense demand to be in there. It's brought the prices up, particularly for a city, a capital city, where we've got, say, 350,000 workers in retail and in finance industry. We're very well paid. So they want to live within 30 minutes, whether it's east or inner west, and they will fight for that market and raise those prices. But there's vast radial tracks beyond that, if only they were accessible more, much more quickly. And this is where public transport is the gift that government can give to the success of the oils of the city to work. If you leave it to the market, then you know, uh, gentrification housing will always outprice the hospitality worker who has to fold sheets in a hotel at midnight and has to live an hour and a half out of the city because of the poor public transport. So, but just, can't those, those people live in the city as well? well they, is that out of, out of, out of, out of the their question? budget? It's out of their budget if yeah. they're buying. But uh, if you go for rent control, which is the key worker housing initiatives that we're currently exploring, um, that does give them some prospects. But um, in the marketplace, it's a competition to be near the jobs that pay well. And that's why I say public transport is the answer to release far more affordable housing that we haven't tapped into. Well, we, we could have a whole evening on public transport. That's I'm sure we've all got our own stories. But Lu Lucy, as a politician or an ex-politician, perhaps you still are, um, how do you deal with this issue of, of, of buying, getting the community to buy in to the visions that we, we see for our city? Well, I think, I think um, we drastically need to undertake an analysis and, 
and um, develop better models for community engagement because there aren't enough people really engaged in, in um, the conversation about the future of our cities. Just going back briefly to your comment about Docklands, I, I, I agree with you, it's not a, an unalloyed success, but I think to say that spectacle is always a bad thing is a little bit of a stretch too. I, I do, and our city has quite a bit of spectacle in it, natural and built spectacle, and I think that that's actually one of Sydney's great attributes. I mean, things like the Opera House, the Harbour Bridge, the Botanic Gardens, I can think of some fabulous office towers in the city, and that will be a personal value judgment. And just quickly um, uh, taking a little bit of issue with what you said about Southwark, I think one of the most exciting things about Southwark is actually the Shard. That is a, you know, very design-led, completely out of the box and completely off the scale of the horizon intervention into a part of um, inner but southern London, which is, which is part of an, a massive and I think very positive regeneration of that area where they're actually keeping the good bits, really, the, you know, like the, the borough market and all the good bits about Southwark, but they're, they're, they're loading into it some exciting dynamism of the future. And I think good place making and good city making is always about a strong balance between cherishing things that have, have value, like this, this pier, for example, to use a very good example, but also to take an imaginative and innovative steps to make our city better, not just to sit on our laurels and say, change is bad. We've got to adopt change, adapt change, and bring people with us. But there are parts of Sydney where, where the NIMBY, or, or even the banana factor, is a dominant one. Yeah. People who simply see the sorts of visions that we as planners and urban designers would see as perfectly valid, perfectly achievable, and the bananas get up and say, not here, not, he not here, not never. How do we bring those folks into this conversation? Because participation is, is a bit of a touchstone of, of, of planning orthodoxy these days, and yet we find ourselves increasingly uh, sort of more and more difficult to achieve that. John, yeah, okay. Uh, well, I think that one, one way of doing it is actually to, and I, 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 I do this on an individual basis, but also in, in groups of people during that sort of coag discussion process and lots of other things I do. I think you actually have to stress the intergenerational equity implications of doing nothing anywhere. And I think that's one way that you can actually reach through to the kind of like the, the, the um, natural reflex of people to want in, to want nothing to change in their area because they're very happy with things the way they are. They, and you, if you put the question, well, do you ever want your children or your grandchildren to be able to afford to live anywhere near here, short of having, you know, really, really, a, a, you know, very, very, you know, prosperous life? If they have normal lives, they will never be able to afford to live here. What do you think about that? And that's actually a way of putting the challenge back to them to come back with why no change is ever a good thing. Peter, John, you were going to comment. No, I think um, a big player in this is the media. And I think the media concentrates on conflict and doesn't deliver education. And um, I think that's a really large problem. And we, all of us, are also part of this problem in that we need to be more articulate and more um, communicative in explaining why and how the city changes, but also ensure that that change is a beneficial change, is not a, a change that is seen as being negative. So Lucy's point is a very good point to concentrate on what the future of your city will be for all of those who come after you. And that we need to concentrate on how you make that future an attractive, reliable future. The other problem we have is a lack of good governance. And so it's very difficult at the moment to actually portray a picture of the future which is credible because, uh, in fact, we've been disappointed through a lot of governance and that any picture we portray of the future is actually not believed. You know, people don't believe there'll be a north-west rail link because there hasn't been one several times over. Yeah. People don't believe that increased density can give you increased amenity in your housing and a more enjoyable life because they've seen where more often than not, increased density hasn't been accompanied by better amenity and hasn't been accompanied by things that are better in your daily life. Yeah. So I think those are the keys, are actually communicating, first of all, agreeing amongst ourselves and others 
what the future of the city should be like. And then secondly, conveying it with um, conviction and with truth, how it can come about. They're the critical things. And if you don't do that, everyone should be a NIMBY because why would you want failure in your backyard? You, you wouldn't want that. What you want in your backyard is success. And, and that's what we have to aim at doing. Peter Thalys, you, you've, been a, you've been part Philip. of a conflict. Is it Philip? Uh, is it Philip? Philip. Philip, sorry. Philip. Yeah, Philip. sorry, I, I thought My I was mistake. going there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you've been part of the conflict over certain key developments mm. in the city. Uh, and involved in the politics over that. What's your, what's your perspective well, look, we're all involved in we... politics, we're all here. You know, well, we're all true. citizens and um, we're all seeking this, this sort of engagement that, that Peter John's talking about. And I think we see a huge uh, range of uh, uh, qualities of governance from city council over a 20-year period, uh, of mm -hmm. fantastic leadership, and we have so much to thank the city council for and its mayors. Um, to state governments, which actually have been fabulous at various periods in our history. And it's easy to, to be completely negative about state governments, uh, our state government, but you know, we are actually in one of the great urban projects ever realised in Australia, if not you know, of a global scale, which is the reconstruction of the wharves by the Sydney Harbour Trust, a state government agency. The whole area resumed by the state government with the explicit aim of renewing the entire waterfront. And then the, the absence of the federal government. And this is a key failing, and um, a failing of both sides of Parliament with a, a couple of minutes of sunshine in the last 30 years. So we had building better cities for seven minutes in 1991 or two, when was it? And we were promised that again in 2007. It, it hasn't happened. You know, you have to go back to Dirt in what, 1972 or something from your planning history. Uh, where is the federal government? in making cities and in investing in cities. Why can't we think about cities in a holistic way rather than having silos of each of these separate elements and discontinuities, dramatic discontinuities between the three tiers of government? Mm. That's just a complete failure of government. The it's John. a failure of what I'd call public imagination for what we could make the cities into. John, you've got a great deal of international experience here. This issue of governance comes up again and again when you talk about cities and delivering plans and what, how to make plans work. What's your experience of, of, of the governance issue in, in, the, in the international context that you've seen? Is it necessary? Is good governance absolutely critical? I mean, or can we get, a, get by without it? Because it's the sort of thing we may have to do here. Good governance isn't necessarily critical, but it's fundamentally important. <laughs> um, right. I think the other issue is um, of stressing what we have achieved. And we tend to be negative, and this is picked up by the media, and uh, everything is seen as going wrong. Uh, we need to stress what is uh, going well, both within governance and also within the projects that have, have been produced. And there is a lot of, there are many, many projects around the world which are highly successful in a multi-dimensional manner and we can learn a lot from them. I do believe that we do have a strong educative role and the ability to communicate what works and what does not work becomes very, very important. Okay. Well, we've all had a, a chat on the stage. I think it's time, uh, we've got half an hour of, uh, of the proceedings left. I think it's time for you guys to throw some questions to this panel and uh, perhaps get, get John to talk again as well. So. Uh, questions from the floor. I've got a microphone here. If somebody will come up and take it from me and give it to the people who are going to speak. Can we have a, a useful... Thank you, Andy. Good. It'll be turned on. So, can we take some questions, please? Just say who you are. Be nice. To, to Hi, to I'm Catherine Bridge. I'm from University of New South Wales. I'm actually part of City Futures. Um, I guess if we go back to John's um, first slides and he was talking about housing renaissance, I guess one of the things that obviously struck me in your slide was that the global financial crisis and, and um, funding and you know, the, the role of banks in financing and in development um, wasn't mentioned and yet that obviously correlated quite well with the downward slide. I would, I guess, like to open that up to the audience and particularly, I guess, the, um, the panel in terms of how important is that going to be for the development of the City of Sydney? Um, potentially, I guess, given that we've had a collapse of quite a large number of our housing um, and other building 
industry things more recently. Okay, well, I'm happy to have a bit of a go at that. So, uh, <clears throat> funding for development's probably been the biggest squeeze on housing supply, actually, as opposed to approvals. Um, the um, valuations from banks, for example, have dropped by about 20% or maybe 25, which means every developer has to find 25% more cash to actually do the development than the previous funding models. Furthermore, any affordable housing components or other uncountable, where it's difficult for a bank to actually foreclose, they find it difficult to land on those components within market housing projects. So it is, the, the biggest impact has been commercial finance. The firms that internally finance, such as Meriton, for example, are able just to continue going ahead without actually having to deal with that particular, particular issue, which is much more common. So it's actually the biggest issue uh, at the moment in terms of starts. The City of Sydney has around 5,500 dwelling approvals that haven't resulted in starts, largely due to the um, valuation ratios that are being applied at the present time. John Punter, do you want to comment on the British? Well, it's exactly the same in the UK, only, only worse, I think, because our financial system is much, much more at risk. And uh, the government, of course, is um, feeding that in, in some senses. But the collapse you saw in, uh, in housing production is exactly that. It's that people who are sure bets, really, cannot get a mortgage. Uh, young people cannot get uh, accommodation. So it's a, it's a criti absolutely critical issue. And not only that, but they are saying to us that this will not change for five, six, eight years. So what, what will be happening at the end of that period is you know, little short of, uh, well, you know, they'll all be moving back with their parents and maybe that will change uh, into generational attitudes rather quickly. Heaven forbid. Yep. I think it's also, um, it's good to think about the city as a much longer term place and thing than it is just today. So um, I'd recommend everyone go back to the 1970s and read Murray Daly's book, Sydney Boom, Sydney Bust, mm. which is a kind of classical um, thesis on the intersection of housing supply, cost of housing and housing finance. And of course it has an ideological bent. It's really just a Sydney explanation of Engel's book from 120 years ago, The Housing Problem. And um, the housing problem is that, as Engels puts it in a very ideological way, is that there's always enough housing, the problem is its distribution. And you can see this because Sydney, for example, has the highest square metre house size of any major city in the world. And our housing shortage is relatively, today, less than many other comparable cities. So a radical, impossible, ideological answer was, is just the redistribution of housing. That's, of course, impossible today. But um, given that impossibility, what has to happen is a very uh, difficult but focused debate on what are the roles of finance, government, and housing, and how do they intersect? Of course, that debate, I think, is actually completely hidden and continues to be disguised. As Graham's implemented, in, indicated, state government, for example, will blame local government slow in approving housing, but in fact, the approvals are there. The banks will quite rightly say that they should be um, more fiscally responsible and that um, oversupply of housing was in fact part of the reason for the financial crisis and poor lending practices. In the United practices. States. In the yeah. United States. In the United States. But um, it's a kind of global question in a way. We suffer from that. So um, we do need to open up this debate, which is very difficult, and uh, to find solutions. And the other factor that's happening in New South Wales, which is also happening globally, is that uh, government has withdrawn from housing production almost completely. And a big modifying factor in past bust times in Sydney was production of housing by government. And um, that seems to be almost completely off the political agenda. And it seems that no one is willing to 
even raise it in a serious way. So it's, it's a very complicated but very centrally important question for the future of our city. Look, I think it's fair to comment though that Department of Housing are looking to double the dwelling numbers on their existing sites. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and it's... Not a very low base, but yeah. it's good. So, you know, things like Redford Waterloo, um, they're, they're actually got a, a, you know, a reasonable set of targets about the difference between market housing, social housing and affordable housing. We don't disagree, actually, with their breakdown and strategy. And um, so they are using their property to internalise and double the, um, the number of dwellings on, on their properties. So I just make that one yeah. caveat on that comment. Well, that implies, again, it's public action. I mean, we're assuming what will happen in Redfern and Waterloo will be a good urban design outcome. There will be good design which isn't driven necessarily by the uh, requirements to ensure profitability, although it's, it has to well, stack up. Well, can I just up. say, I'm on the board of the SMDA, which you know is one of the, I guess, agencies involved in, in the Redford Waterloo project. I think what's really important with Redford Waterloo is that there, you know, this is where planning in a vacuum can often not be a great thing. The planning outcomes have to be feasible, feasibly delivered to be, they have to be feasible to be delivered. Yeah. You can't, you can't undertake massive planning if the economics of actually delivering the outcomes, which is a massive transformation of, you know, a fairly so, of quite a slow, socially disadvantaged part of Sydney, can't be delivered because you build all these expectations in the in the community that there will be this positive, you know, really positive good change, and then, you know, if it doesn't if it doesn't work, it won't happen, and that will actually feed into a sense of perception and actual disadvantage okay. going forward. So that is actually a really interesting challenge: is to deliver the outcomes that need to be delivered in Redfern Waterloo to create a more mixed, sustainable community in a, in a, in a good urban environment. Because it's quite interesting, I think the, you know, the mark one of the public housing in Redfern Waterloo was kind of like the Corbusian dream gone crazy. And so what you have to do is you know, modify and moderate the values in that dream and actually make it work as a community. Well, it's fundamentally important to make it work. Mm. And, uh, um, but to make it work, it has to be deliverable. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be feasible. <laughs> Another question. <coughs> Howard Tanner, I'm an architect. Um, it seems to me that uh, in Sydney, certainly at various times, there's been an enormous concern that we should improve ourselves. We should actually make a better place. And... Uh, in the history of Sydney, you can see those sequences. But at the moment, I have a concern that apart from some initiatives perhaps coming out of the city of Sydney, there is no, there is no plan that Sydney's going to be a better place in 40 years' time. It's that everything's okay, it'll just be more of the same. Well, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's plausible. We actually have to have some real initiative and something more than a four-year term to realise it. So how do you get there? Well, Back to politics. Yeah, I don't think it's that bad, actually. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you point to the city of Sydney. They are a leader in this area, but there are others that are following them. So I think that's really encouraging. The second thing is that this new government has, against all odds, against the advice of the Treasury, against um, lack of finance from the federal government, said that they will build the North West Rail Link. And at this stage, I'm convinced that they will build it. And so I think that's a turnaround and that's a, a positive turnaround. We have in New South Wales, as I mentioned before, better quality residential development because of state government um, policy action. And that's, that same state government is reviewing that policy action with the aim to improve that further. We also have a kind of important, um, positive, but also possibly dangerous um, point now where the whole of the planning regime is being reviewed and on the positive side will be made simpler and easier to communicate but on the dangerous side of course we're all um, scared of what we're going to lose. So engaging in that planning reform is one way of, um, as Howard puts it, concentrating on a better future. So um, you know, I think there's always bad things happening but it's always good to try to harness the positive things as well, 
and those positive things are not non-existent. They're there. I just say how I totally, to some extent, agree with what you're saying, but I think I can see signs that are more positive. You know, sort of over the last few years, for example, the Sydney Metro Plan, which was done in 2005, uh, took no, virtually no cognizance of the need for integrated tran transport and land use planning. It was, and that was for the. Um, the fiefdom reasons that the then planning minister wasn't speaking to the transport minister. That was a very bad combination of events. So the impact of that plan was really sort of st sort of still born because it, 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 was, it, it didn't have, it w wasn't an example of good integrated planning. And, and I think, you know, to some extent the 2010 plan, and I hope the new Sydney Metro plan actually goes back to heal over that fundamental uh, mistake. And um, I think that there is a better understanding that you can't just plan things in a vacuum. They have to, what I find very interesting is that there are these city centres outside the city which are developing like uh, Macquarie Park, which basically I don't think were ever terribly planned at a state government level, but they, for, for reasons of land ownership by Macquarie University and, you know, I, I guess a, 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 a co-op, sort of like a helpful ride council, these areas in terms of the the workforce and everything are starting to rival places like Parramatta. So, so these, you know, the city can grow and evolve and develop in a very positive way, not always with massive government intervention and guidance, and Macquarie Park's a good example of that. And I think we have to, in our planning, look at the things that are working well, not always with massive go government intervention, and nurture those things, as well as having a kind of like a big strategic Napoleonic vision of what we want to do, actually work with what's working start with that too. I think the other aspect of it, 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 it I agree with how it's very easy to be negative, it, to look around it. And one of the, the, the reasons Peter, John and I wrote our book was actually to try to find a positive agenda in Sydney. And of course, one of the great things about positive interventions is they last, or they should last. And so Sydney, in fact, and if you look at the Metro plan of 2005, they're building all the centres on the railway lines that were in fact built in the 1860s. Yep. Mm. And so what we've not had in, in the last 70 years is any commensurate public transport investment with the growth of the city. So you look back at 1940, there were something like 160 stations, uh, less than 2 million people, less than half the urban area today. Since the war, we've built 14 stations, all of them on truncated lines. That's pathetic. So what we'd be expecting from a new transport plan, or a new metropolitan plan, is a long-term vision for implementing public transport that actually re-engages with a fabulous tradition of building public transport that we had in Sydney um, from 1860 to 1920. We were one of the best cities in the world. Remember also, not only haven't we built the, the railway stations, we've ripped out one of the best trans systems in the world as well. What a stupid decision that was. It's important to reiterate those things. It's important also to re reiterate the things we've done well and the things that have got durable value. And I think this is one of the things that urban design can really focus on. Because it should be centred on the public good and the public domain, it should concentrate on the things that government can deliver or have a, a guiding hand in the delivery of them and the things that actually sustain our city. And that's, for me, a dichotomy with planning which has become obsessed with development values. And that balance is what's missing. But it's been in evidence right, that, that dichotomy has been in evidence right through our city's history and most cities' histories, and it's very clearly shown in England today. We've got to learn from that, and we've got to articulate it, as Peter John says. Another question over there. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Yeah, hi, my name's Mark. I'm a graduate of the planning degree at uh, UNSW and currently practicing in the city of Newcastle. Um, I guess. Uh, you know, I just wanted to, I'm from a finance background and I guess my question is simply about lots of great ideas um, but urban design's got to be paid for. Uh, so the tricky question is, is how would you pay for some of the things that urban design does, like a oh, better transport that. system and so forth? And I don't just mean the state government coughing up and taxpayers coughing mm. up. I also mean like, you know, should, uh, uh, I guess, developers be taking a haircut, uh, you know, getting out of bed for more than, or for less than 20%. You know, um, but they'll tell you they are. Well, yeah, but okay, if they are, that's great. But let's uh, so let's hear some suggestions so, about how do we pay for so good what's urban the design. Proposition for yeah, good urban design. I think this is, you know three extremely good questions so far, and this is a central question, mm -hmm. and it, it's quite a difficult question today because um, 
net benefit is calculated on net present value over a limited period of time. And um, so what that means though, is that um, things that produce a value quickly are more advantageous than things that produce value slowly and surely. And it's, it's a fraught situation and I'm not an economist, I don't know the way out. But what I can give you is a few examples. The Sydney Harbour Bridge would never be built under that economic formula. And in fact, Treasury advised the state government continually for 50 years not to build the bridge. Now, can you imagine economically the city today without the City Harbour Bridge? It would be a disaster. It would be nowhere near the economic powerhouse, in a way, or the economic success that the city is without that bridge. Yet, it could never have been built under that formula. The Sydney Opera House would never have been built under that formula. The whole of the railway system mm -hmm. of Sydney would never be built under that formula. And in fact, that's why it hasn't been built in the post-war period. And that Cost railway benefit analysis. And that railway, Sword technique. that railway system enables people to get to work, to get to visit their friends, to all these things in the daily eye life of the city, but it enables Parramatta, Ryde, Bondi Junction, Hurstville, all these places in our city, Penrith, Campbelltown, it enables their growth. And it enables a growth that is unimaginable in economic terms in 1860. Absolutely unimaginable and unable to be formulated. And I could just go on and on. We wouldn't have Hyde Park. We wouldn't have most of the streets of the city so I guess wouldn't the, be 66 foot so wide, so they'd be 30 foot wide. So I guess the question is, and back to you, to formulate an economic model that actually would properly value this essential infrastructure on which the city depends. Well, can I, say, can I just say something there, just butt in? I think, I think the, the problem in the system at the moment is that there is a, a bifurcated analysis at the level of government because they have to worry about things like their credit rating and whether they're mm -hmm. going to be able, what their cost of borrowing will be, which is, a, which is a rational concern for them to have. So that they look at new infrastructure in a financial way and they look at it in the financial time horizon that they have, which is the forward estimates, which are typically, you know, four to five years, three mm -hmm. to five years, I think, you know, That's certainly no more than five years. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at, at, at any investment in infrastructure in a financial way without attaching uh, any, a, a sufficient value to the economic benefits of that investment in infrastructure. And that's, that's the weakness in the system. It sounds very arcane to divide financial cost benefit and economic cost benefit, but that's the missing, that's the missing piece. I mean, way back in the 1920s when they decided to build the bridge, which they'd been talking about for 50 years, so don't let's imagine that they got there quickly. Um, that that was well, first kind of proposed in 1812. 18, exactly. So, um, <laughs> but but that, that was sort of like a brave leap into the unknown. It turned out to be a really really good investment. Um, uh, but now there's a lot more analysis because if you think about the investment in the Cross City Tunnel, that's you know that that was that was developed and created as an idea and an, an executed concept way after computers were invented. So what what went what went wrong there? What was that? What what was the problem there? Massive massive miscalculation of the traffic volumes because they had to make a, a quick return. So it's, it's just, it's a different, we are working in a different landscape. It's very hard for planners and architects and city, um, city administrators to change the economic system, but that's the environment we live in. We can try to shift it and shift people's beliefs and expectations. And that's a big job to do. But Lucy, why doesn't Treasury change its methods? Well, because they're looking to their credit well, I mean, I'm not in charge of Treasury, right? So, um, but, they, but they're looking across the forward estimates mm -hmm. and, and they, they look at an in investment or, or something like a, you know, cross city tunnel or a whatever, a, a new railway line and whatever they should be looking at in that, on that reasonably short time horizon in terms mm -hmm. of the financial costs. But surely there must be also historical economists as well. The, the, I just said, go on, the other, the other thing we haven't quite done yet in, in Sydney or Australia yeah is actually create a good model for, um, for the government taking some of the, the cream off the l increased value in land, mm. which is a function of yes, investment in infrastructure, that, what they call value, value capture. And that's a very vexed issue and it's not made any simpler by the, the, the complexity of our federal and state and local tax yeah. system. 
But yep. you know, in an ideal world, they, they do it much more easily in other countries. But my question is more fundamental than that, in a way. Sorry? My question is a little bit more fundamental than that, because okay. I've, I've read the Treasury advice on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and it's emphatically, no, don't do this. Mm. Quite mm. emphatic. And um, I, I just, you know, as a non-economist, I can see, yes, if you apply this method of analysis, you shouldn't do it. But what I can't see is how you can make a city, like a metropolitan city, without these things, without railway lines, without bridges. Well, you, there's no argument. You can't. I know, no, but, but, yeah. but all we hear is you can't. You know, the reason why the last government couldn't build what it kept trying to promise was that Treasury was saying, no, you can't. I think there is an difficult. exception, though, yep. and that is coming back to the strategic thinking about what's the economic underpinning of the city. There is one exception at the moment, which is the $1 billion investment in the renewal of the convention and exhibition facilities. One of the five streams, you might say, that will underpin the city in the future, business tourism. The economic modelling was done. The cost centres were done, the value to the city was done, the hospitality employment issues were looked at, all of those sorts of things, and the city and the state decided, while it's fairly penniless, that's the one thing, even though they were still functioning facilities that were what, only built in 1988, uh, that they would actually renew the entire package. Mm -hmm. So there's an example where that kind of level of investment... And that's all about competitiveness with has, other cities. ...has yeah. been taken on. So, while the, the, the other issue is generally true, um, you know, uh, now to get to you, the answer to your question, there are models where, for example, if a new rail line, high speed rail connection is put through which unlocks access to labour into the city quite quickly and more affordable housing situations, that um, uh, the rates associated with businesses within 400 or 800 square metres of each of the additional stations are uh, increased for a period of time and proportionally the residential rates are increased and it's split in some kind of formula that's reasonably equitable about what the ad added advantage is of that piece of investment but then that might only be a 30% contribution over the long term because then it's spread over multiple generations as well. So what the government does is carry the future generation component and share the current generation component with the current generation. But that's not happening anywhere yet. No, but that's no. happening in other places, yeah. such as in the States. Yeah. Well, it'd be, it'd be interesting to ask John that question, whether that was used at all in England. I mean, don't think Betterman taxes a new houseman used them in Paris. You know, why have we taken 140 years to even discuss it? But John, has it been used at all in England? <clears throat> well, Betterman policy was 1933 in the UK. You know, the Barlow report was all about about that issue, and it's something that we have never we've never taken forward. You know, you look at uh, the new towns, the Letchworth and uh, places like that, Welling Garden City. Mm -hmm. They've continued to make enormous amounts, significant amounts of money, which have been ploughed back into the communities, mm -hmm. and they have benefited hugely from that. Uh, it's simply that uh, the, a different kind of economic ideology has taken over. And, of course, that has intensified enormously in the last four or five years. Well, it didn't take long to get to the bean counters, but uh, it looks like that's where the source of the problem is. We've got one question at the front and one at the back, and that'll have to be it. We're nearly at the time. Can I go to one, Bruce? Do you want to go? Say again? No. Okay. Paola Favaro, um, involved with the University of New South Wales in architecture and urban design programs. Just uh, looking at the John Panther's very informative uh, lecture, finished with a successful example of the London Olympic uh, project and development. So if uh, urban renaissance uh, can be historically explained in some way as uh, the uh, spirit, like uh, the new spirit, uh, for the improvement of the city. I wonder if uh, only with special projects, uh, like uh, special projects where the, um, the focus is international and the focus is uh, like the Olympics or the Expo, just with this we can uh, achieve uh, what uh, John introduced at the beginning of the lectures are the four main factors uh, of uh, achieving a good uh, urban renaissance project. So you mentioned political stability, 
urban design framework, housing supply and quality of the public realm. If uh, only on this spe specific uh, project or special project we are able to achieve uh, all these factors, I wonder how can we learn from uh, this specific project eh, and make it that an, uh, um, a viable uh, venue for our cities? Well, I think, I mean, the point about the London Olympics was that money was no object in most senses of the term. And when you look at how much money was spent, I forget what the figure is, is it 9 billion or something like that? It's a huge, it's a vast sum um, that the, uh, the amount of investment that was put into that project on the back of one or two other key decisions like Stratford and the... Uh, the, the, channel, the channel route, the uh, link to France and to the continent and all of that. Um, I think that most people feel that money was thrown at the Olympics and that the things that were produced, um, they're waiting to see how they actually materialize. The, the um, points that I made were that I thought that what Land Lease had built at uh, Stratford was a very good model for what needed to be built in the rest of the UK in terms of high density um, apartment living that was also um, with good communal space and a good interface with the public environment. I think if I was to stretch it into what's good about Westfield, I would have a lot more difficulty because Westfield is essentially an interior design of excellence that externally leaves a lot to be desired. So I think that, um, and, and when you look at the stadium, for example, it's quite obvious that we cannot convert the stadium to serve both, Olymp both, sport both athletics and football. Uh, and that is going to be a, a major problem for us. Um, the only other side of the, the issue is that we, put, we did put the Olympics in the right place. It was entirely right that it should go into the East End. And everything really hangs on whether the legacy of the Olympics actually benefits the inhabitants of the East End. And I think that's an open question. Really. There's a gentleman at the back in the red. Yeah. Uh, follows from a whole lot of stuff you said earlier about governments with their narrow thinking and bottom line thinking and that's about all. Um, I suppose I phrase it as a question. Uh, in current government, what percentage are uh, accountants and lawyers and what percentage are architects and engineers? And is part of the solution getting a few more architects and engineers in there? <laughs> No, I think you know, the Politburo is in China is dominated by engineers, is, and yeah. I wouldn't hold that up as a good example of government. So I, I think it's kind of irrelevant. Well, they get things actually. done. And probably the more economists <laughs> and lawyers we have in government, the better that we are, because they have the skills to deal with these complex questions, actually. They have better skills for those things. Well, some. Well, some of them, yes, maybe some of them. And I would, but equally, I think there are places in government for people with design skills as well, and um, we have been lacking that in government, yes. Graham? Yeah, look, I'd just like to say finish with two, two thoughts. One is that I'm much more optimistic about Sydney than most people are, and I think that you need to be dissatisfied in order to help propel change. But having said that, Sydney in 200 years has come from a colony not funded by an empire, like uh, the European cities, it's come from, from nothing, really. And in those 200 years, it's now one of the te 10 top livable cities in the world. Yeah. And that is phenomenal, really. I don't know what other examples there are. Other cities that have been around for 2,000 years are barely able to survive on a, you know, think of Athens, but are able to survive on a year-to-year on -year basis. Um, and so I think we've done an enormous job, actually, with no finance, off the back of individuals who came here, who self-funded and borrowed and eventually have created the city that we have. And secondly, you know, I think that through the stable government question, the city of Sydney, at least over the last decade, has relatively had 
a very um, outward looking and forward thinking approach. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think that there is a stable, there, well, there is now a stable regime, you'd have to say, in this particular city, and, and a vision that is what has allowed its constituents to virtually buy into some very significant change. And you can see that along um, South Dowling Street, for example. Coming well, back to the uh, question that was asked, I do believe that there is, uh, it's very important to look at the design implications of policies. And there are many, many examples of policies in the verbal form which sound marvelous, but when they're put into place, um, the results have been um, not what was expected. And so, in that sense, um, more exploration with architects um, of policies, I think it's very, very important on a continuing basis. And that's a call for more research, isn't it? That the <laughs> well, that's, a, that's actually a very good time good for idea. me just to end the session, really. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I'm sorry, Bruce, we're, we're, past, uh, we're past 8 o'clock, and, um, and, and the drinks are all lined up at the back. I can see them, uh, and some people are already clutching theirs. So, look, I'd like to thank, uh, uh, thank the, the, the panel very much. Peter John Cantrell, uh, Graham Yarn, Philip Thallis, got it right, uh, John Lang, Lisa Turnbull, and uh, John Punter, our star guest for tonight. So, please, hands together. <clears throat> um, my, my last a bit of run out of, uh, bit of run out of questions. I was going to ask you, how are you going to do good design in South Granville, which is more than my bet noir about how are we going to plan South Granville? But maybe you can, we can join us over drinks and discuss that. Discuss that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, right. indeed. Okay. One moment, please. <coughs> a message from our dean. Well, I. I'll be one minute. I'd like to just do two things. I mean, after this fascinating uh, exploration of uh, finance, politics, and city design, where I think we need to understand how they can integrate more effectively, how designers can understand politics and finance, and frankly, finances and people in governance and leadership roles can understand design, how we can integrate that better. After that fantastic discussion, I have the job of closing luminosity. Um, a week of activities which have, we thought, 3,000 people would be a bottom end, 5,000 people would be the top end. We've, we've, we've somewhere between six and 7,000, we think, and probably closer to seven. To uh, close luminosity, I'd like to um, ask Alan Peters to come to the stage. Uh, Alan has been the leader of luminosity, um, head of school, deputy dean, and a professor of planning. Um, he and his team have delivered uh, in-house this event, which is a, a great achievement and shows why UNSW and our faculty is quite distinctive. We really can say we're the only faculty that really focuses on the design, delivery, and management of the 21st century city and its elements. But we've tried to put it on show, and thank you for, for coming. But I'd like to thank Alan uh, for this achievement and ask him to say a few words. So <clears throat> I realize you desperately want to drink, but I've got to, I've got to thank a few people. Uh, the designer of this exhibition is an incredibly talented man who is one of ours. He's standing at the back there, Andrew Folks. Well done, Andrew. <clears throat> Supporting Andrew is the guy right next door to him, uh, Jeff Webster, who did incredible work this last week. Um, the core group also consists of the, of the following people, and because it could take a long time, I think I'm just going to read them out and we clap at the end. The core group work, uh, Cassandra James, who did all the event planning for this, Laura Chambers, who did work on the web, um, on many, many words and on many, many programs. Liz Roberts, who did work on graphics and the schools program and the TAFE program. Uh, Zara Birch, who produced the catalogues. Uh, Claudia Maroon, my EA, who well, she managed me and she managed pretty much most things here. And uh, Peter McConaughey, our general manager, who made sure everything really worked. So for that core group, well done. Thank you. <laughs> 
there were a few other people, I'm not going to mention them all, but there, around that core group there are lots of supporting staff, including Catherine Brown, our development manager, Sam Sheridan, our alumni person, and uh, Barry Webb, and numerous other people, including the student representatives and program directors. I really would like to thank them all. Thank you. I think it's all over. <laughs> <laughs>